Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome back, listeners, and hi to our new ones who found us up on YouTube. This is a new adventure for the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. So please like or comment, especially if there's a topic that we haven't covered and you would be interested in exploring. Today, we're going to be talking about navigating grief when you're a highly competent woman in a leadership role. And even if you're not, or you don't recognize or let yourself feel that you're a highly competent woman, just rest assured that you all are. And I'm certain there'll be wisdom nuggets from our guest that will apply to everyone. So please stay with us. I am absolutely thrilled to be chatting once more to Deborah Vogue who is a crisis navigation partner with a 30 plus years of experience as a leadership researcher, executive and advisor. Her research work was carried out primarily at Harvard Business School and she's also the author of an award-winning book. Her work has been featured in Forbes and other large publications. Needless to say, Deborah's accomplishments are outstanding, and I'll post more of them in the show notes. For now, let's welcome Deborah to the show. Hello, Deborah. Hey, I'm so hello. delighted. I'm so happy to talk to you again. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> oh, me too. Now, for our listeners, hearing just a few of your accomplishments may be thinking, how can you have experienced any challenges or crisis? Her <laughs> life sounds perfect. Sure. Um, okay. People might think that that is jumping to a conclusion. Let me give you some more data. Yes, I did do the things that you talked about, most of them. I'll make a correction. And um, whatever you put in the show notes, I probably did do also. I didn't write that book. I was a researcher on that book that was written by the two Harvard Business School professors. So I don't want to take too much credit for that, just so you know. But yeah, I've had a lot of really exciting career experiences, and I've gotten to go to school in some amazing, inspiring places. And I've had up and ups and downs throughout because, spoiler alert, I'm a human being. So in all of our lives as humans, we have wins, we have losses, we have celebrations, we have sources of grief, right? So yeah, through my, my business is going to be, I can't get over this, it's going to be 25 years old in 12 days. And I feel like I have to keep checking my math because that doesn't sound right, but it's true. And in those 25 years since I started the business, I've had children. I've gotten divorced. I've lost people who were very meaningful to me in different ways. I have dealt with my kids' challenging diagnoses. One has severe anxiety. The other one has type 1 diabetes. I've had times of business where it was booming. I've had times of business where I was kind of bored by it, even though it was okay success-wise. I've had months where I've had many tens of thousands of dollars of revenue in one month. I've had months where I've had many hundreds of dollars of revenue in one month. So what I've learned through all this is that life ebbs and flows and that when I just try to push my own agenda because I'm so determined to get my list done there I have more suffering 
than when I allow myself to go with the flow. Okay, this week I've had a lot of opportunities to extrovert. I'm doing this podcast interview with you. A couple of days ago, I gave a talk in person. I have gone on three dates and I've met some really good people for business development purposes. And I went to a, a referral partnership networking meeting. That's what this week has been about. I haven't written a thing. I haven't written any new content. That's okay. This week, my energy is going out. Next week, there'll be more energy where I want to go inward. This week, I have something to celebrate. Next week, I might have something that I'm really at loss about. Probably I'll have both next week. And that's just part of life. So I hope that answers your question. There's no like fairy tale for anybody. And I realize that. And I'm here to walk with people when the hope for a fairy tale that takes a dark turn in the woods. Yeah. And it's always part of the fairy tale. That is part of the fairy tale. So as you can hear, listeners, we don't have to have the perfect life. We can't. On paper. This is one of those um, judgment things, isn't it? Oh, look at that person's life. They look amazing on the outside but it's what's going on in the inside that isn't showing, eh? Yeah, yeah. And everyone has things worthy of celebration going on sometimes, and everyone has things worthy of struggle sometimes. And it doesn't really matter the name of the organization that you work for or you go to school at. You're going to have both. Yeah. And the key is to be willing to ride those waves, I think. That's what I'm learning as I come into my old age. Yes, learning to ride the waves rather yeah. than pushing against them, yes. which is something we can so easily do. We want to achieve. We want to do the next thing. And we push, push, push. Yes. And we all know what can happen when we push. Yes, yes. Let's, well, let's just say it out loud in case we don't all know. We get sick. <laughs> we we get injured, we lose our energy, we make mistakes. I mean, of course, any of those things can happen anytime, but when we over push and we get more into burnout mode, all those things are more likely to happen. And we still don't listen, do we? Mm -hmm. We continue it. Going through divorce, dealing with health issues from your uh, children, mm -hmm. what was your biggest challenge for you, Deb? Um, two things pop into my mind. One is feeling alone, feeling like it's all on me. I got to solve these things. These things are matters of life and death. And if I get these wrong, there's going to be dire consequences. Ah! So feeling solely responsible and feeling isolated at the same time, I think have been my biggest challenges. When I go around giving my talk, my signature talk is called Unmasking Women in Crisis, Three mm -hmm. Keys to Navigating Life's Inevitable Big Challenges. And so in part of the talk, I ask people who here has had an inevitable big challenge, which is a nice code word for crisis. Yes. Everyone says me. And I ask them, okay, were you what I call the person zero, like the person lying in the hospital bed, the center of the problem? Or were you the point person, the person taking care of the person, being the advocate and the organizer for the person lying in the metaphorical hospital bed? And usually my audience are women. And usually they say they've been in both positions. Mm. And then I ask them, well, what did it feel like for you? The biggest trends from what I hear back from women who have been in these kinds of roles as the person zero in a crisis or the point person in a crisis, or worse yet, sometimes both at once, overwhelm, isolation, and exhaustion. Me too. Yeah. So you've noticed that there is a pattern. It doesn't matter what the challenge was yeah. it's how people is it perceive the challenge or how they navigate their way through it good question well I think that a 
crisis. And, you know, when I talk about crisis, I'm talking about things that happen on a personal level that impact you as an individual, your family, your team, your organization. Just Mm -hmm. to be clear, I'm not talking about giant natural disasters, terrorist attacks, the economy of Lebanon uh, falling apart. I'm talking about things that are relatively more local, okay? So for all these kinds of crises that I've been in and I've helped people with, which are dealing with the pandemic, working and leading from home, dealing with a divorce, the loss of a loved one, being diagnosed with a health thing or a mental health thing, or someone you love or a colleague or a direct report being diagnosed, all those kinds of things, I see the trends of those feelings of overwhelm and isolation and exhaustion. Okay. I think those are real. However, the perception thing you bring up is also real. So was I actually all alone when I felt so alone and solely responsible? The truth is, no, I wasn't. But because of my own beliefs and struggles, that's my go-to story in life. It's a script that doesn't help me and it gets me even more agitated. So I have more tools now for myself to really frequently easily remember who's my community, who can I go to? I do have people I can call in the middle of the night even though I'm a single mom, even though I am um, was the only adult in the house for a long time, both my kids are in college now, I still had people I could go to. Did I really deal with a lot of crappy stuff? Yes, I did. <laughs> did I feel isolated? Yes. Was that accurate? Sort of. And I think the same with the overwhelm. I mean, I felt overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed for fair reason, but could I have shifted my mindset such that I wasn't so focused on the overwhelm and instead I was focused on here's what the next right thing is to do? Yes, I could have. So my my answer to your question is it's both. So it's perception as well as you noticing these these patterns um, of behaviors that Mm -hmm. uh, are, are being exhibited. Yeah. And sorry, one more thing I wanted to share about that is for me, a crisis, whether it's any of the things that we just discussed as examples, a crisis is a situation in which you can't just continue with your regularly scheduled programming. There has to be deviation. There's things happening that you have to take care of right now that wasn't on your plan for the day or for next year. And Usually one of the hallmarks of a crisis is that a lot more decisions need to be made in a shorter period of time than usual. And usually those decisions are more high stakes than the decisions you might make in the rest of your regular non-crisis day. And usually you have to do extra bonus, lots more communication about all of that than you might have to in your regular non-crisis experience time. So the need for increased communication and increased decision-making absolutely drives the sense of increased overwhelm. So there's a lot going on in the person's life. The event has happened. They've got all these decisions. And knowing a little bit about the biology of what's going on in the body we're not able really fully to access that part of the brain that is involved in the decision-making, which can potentially, I can only imagine, put you in a frustrating, more overwhelmed state. Yeah, you're right. I mean, people have different reactions, physical reactions to stress, Mm -hmm. right? There's fight, there's flight, but there's also freeze. There's also flop. And there's one more I've heard that I think is really good. So people have a natural way of reacting to intense situations, intense stress. Mine is go into action, solve the problem right away. That's my own freakishness. Um, (laughs) Afterwards, I fall apart. During, I'm clear, calm, collected, you know, 
ready for action. Um, but for people whose natural go-to with their nervous system is shut down, freeze or flop, you're right. It makes it even more challenging. So if that person is feeling on their own in this situation, it can be hard not to have someone who can contribute a more fully functioning brain in the moment than they have in that moment. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I wasn't quite going there, but thank you for putting (laughs) that up because no, that is all perfect so that people can understand what is actually happening to exacerbate what they're feeling in that moment. So to potentially be a little more gentle with themselves if they are feeling that they just don't have the energy to make those decisions. There's a good reason. So perhaps it's time to go and have a nap or a cup of tea. Right. Or call a crisis navigation partner or somebody else who can, you know, support you. Social supports are so important. Yeah. In times of crisis. Yeah. As well as professional. So you're going through all of this. How has your life changed now as you have learned to navigate those ones? Um, I have a a big wooden desk and I want to knock on it a lot right now and say that my life is a lot easier today than it was, let's say, three or four years ago. Three or four years ago, we were on pandemic lockdown. My kids didn't have in-person school for 14 elapsed months. So they were at home. I was trying to work and run my business, trying to deal with their health things, couldn't have in-person healthcare appointments the way we used to. There was so much. Now, I mean, I just have the advantage of time marching on, but I also have the advantage of all the growth and reflection and shifting and trying new things and experimenting that I've done that have brought me to a better place. So it's kind of two parallel tracks. So now, today, both my kids are on their college campuses doing their own thing. They'll come home again March 18th for spring break. Um, But right now I'm back to living in the house by myself. So there's fewer people to take care of and that makes life much easier. Plus, Mm. you know, I because of the vaccinations. And I mean, I, I'm all for the COVID vaccinations. So not to be political, but I mean, it's we it's safer for us all to go out and be about now. And so my life is easier too, because I can see my friends off screen and I can go run my errands in person, you know, and things that I couldn't do in, you know, March 7th, 2020. That's when the shutdown was really starting where I am in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. So things are much better. Where, what'll happen next week? I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like you are learning to, okay, here is an opportunity. I can face it, but I have the evidence now that new learning and there's going to be a growth once I've gone through it. Is that what I was hearing? Yeah. You- I think we all have the capacity to develop and expand our brilliance based on the crises we experience. Uh, My belief is our brilliance is unique to us based on everything we've experienced in life, the highs, the lows, the goods, the bads, the successes, the failures. So, you know, January 14th, 2010, the day before my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes, I didn't know the difference between type one and type two. I knew nothing about diabetes. Now I have this whole understanding. So when I hear of someone else who their kid was just diagnosed or they were just diagnosed, I have information that can be helpful to share. Um, So that's good. But also I have information for myself from the diabetes experience that I was able to apply to the, now my kid's having severe anxiety experience. Mm -hmm. So I have more content knowledge as part of my brilliance because of the crisis, but also I have improvements that I've, I try to operate in the spirit of continuous improvement. I have improvements that I've made to how I live and run my life and my business. Mm -hmm. So for example, I have gotten a lot more clear about how much spaciousness I need in my day in order to function well. I was packing my days for, you know, 19 hours a day, for sure. 
forgetting to eat, more concerned about calling back that friend who just had some terrible thing happen, who needed help than I was about making sure that I was nourished. Mm -hmm. I had no time of my day that was not previously assigned an agenda topic. At 11 o'clock, I'm talking to Anne. At 12 o'clock, I'm figuring out how to get the water turned back on in my kitchen. You know, like everything was so assigned. And now I have learned I have to mark off time in my calendar every day for what I call spaciousness. Mm. The time is unassigned. And I'll decide when I get there. Do I feel like writing a blog post? Do I need to take a nap? Am I going to return that call? Am I going to go for a swim? I I cannot function having all my time previously arranged before the day gets going because no matter how well I plan, things come up that I didn't expect and my energy wanes over time. So now I've learned that. And one thing I have in my life that I didn't have a year ago was I started doing yin yoga. Do you know this kind Mm -hmm. of yoga? Mm -hmm. Gosh, I love it. I didn't know about it until a year ago. And it's basically meditative stretching and learning to focus on your breath. Now I'm at the point that I'm trying to take a little time every day to do it. Some days I do it for an hour and a half. Some days I do it for 10 minutes. But just having that time where my brain can shut down a little bit and I can expand my body to, you know, just to stretch. Wow, that makes a difference. So that's something else that where my life is better, not just because my kids went off to college, but because I've shifted my relationship to time management. Oh, I love how you said you've recognized that you need spaciousness in your life. And I think that's what we all need to recognize because the minute our feet hit the floor, when we get out of bed, it's that hamster wheel. Go, go, go. Yep. And now look at it. I've got to make supper. And oh, my goodness, when am I going to have some time for me? And and onwards and onwards. Was that something you learned as you were learning to navigate all, all the jumble in your life that you needed? the so. Yes. And, you know, having lots of conversations with my therapist and my coach and my friends. And I just started getting it on a different level. So I'm just looking for on my blog. When I first started yin yoga last week, I'm not last week, last year. (laughs) At first, instead of just lying there and focusing on my breath, which I was supposed to do, I couldn't do that at first. So these phrases kept like flying through my head in my early yoga classes. And I realized, kind of started like writing them down, but I organized them and helped me think. And I realized spaciousness gives me, it empowers me. It enables me to be more present when I am with other people. It makes me healthier and it allows me to feel more joy. It allows me to offer more value to other people through our interactions. It allows me to be of more service. And as a result of all of that, it makes me more um, financially functional, too, because I'm serving from my purpose. So I that turned into a blog post um, that and, and, a, and a piece of art that I printed out and it's on my desk. But it's, if anybody wants to see it, it's on my blog. It's the spaciousness. It's called Spaciousness and Yin for the Win. Hey, okay. um, sit still more in yoga. My brain gets more still during yoga. And and it's interesting when you begin sort of a a meditative practice, such as yin yoga or even meditation, the brain won't stop. Yep. Why are you lying there? Get up. There's this, this, and this. Um, And it's just going with it. And eventually, I mean, I don't think... The brain is meant to stop, but it's certainly not meant to be going 100 miles an hour. So we have a hard time catching it. Yeah, It sounds as if you were able to get out of your head and more into your body so that you could be more present with those women that you were working with. Mm -hmm. And my children. 
and myself. Yeah, and yeah, it it literally brings you back to you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm a. Uh, I love you in yoga. Mm. My cushion in the corner has my plant sitting on it. <laughs> That's nice. So it's <laughs> all about growth. <laughs> but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned that you uh, coach highly professional women. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they are coming to you because they're feeling overwhelmed. They're in a specific crisis in their own lives. Mm -hmm. How are you able to help them navigate the emotions around them, but stay focused at work? Because when you, I mean, these are possibly CEOs, CEOs, um, leaders, Mm -hmm. Mm C-suites, execs. Yeah. It's hard to be dealing with that, but we can't expect them to leave their emotions and leave all that at the door as they step in. Take it from there, Deborah. I don't don't think it would be useful, even if they could. I wouldn't want anyone to leave all their feelings at the door before they step into a conversation with me. I, my orientation is work and life. It's all two sides of the same coin. It's one thing. I, to, to be an authentic leader, to Mm. be an authentic human being, we have to acknowledge the feelings that we have while we're doing. We have to acknowledge how we're being while we're doing, which is not to say that I should show up for all my business meetings and be bawling just because I'm sad that day. I mean, of course there's boundaries, but I like to create a space with my clients where they can bring their whole selves, their thoughts and their feelings, the thoughts that are keeping them from moving forward something that we talk about a lot. What are the beliefs that someone has that are just not accurate? Like Okay, before I called you, I got a call from a client I have whose wife is in, she she was in hospice, she has terminal illness, and then she, she, her blood pressure went up for some reason, we're not really sure why, and she started getting double vision, and so when she was walking, she fell down and she cracked a rib, so then she had to go to the ER, this is like 10 days ago, she had to go to the ER, and then... They couldn't figure out why the blood pressure was going up. There's a point to this story, I swear. Then they said, they sent her uh, back home and said, okay, you know, this, nothing more you can do for the cracked rib. And the next morning, still the double vision, still the wooziness. She tried to go to the bathroom. She fell down. This time she broke her kneecap. Oh. Back to the ER. She had surgery last week. And uh, knee surgery. Now she's in a rehab hospital. And next week they're sending her back home. So her husband called me to let me know what was going on with the in-home rehab services. And he said, I'm going to take a week off from week. I'm going to take a week off from work next week. And then I have business travel for a week. And then we'll start having some help in the house from in-home rehab services because I'll just take care of it. And then her daughter will be there while I'm away. And I said, I completely disagree with that approach. (laughs) How about this? How about while you're at home for the week, you have the in-home rehab services come so you can see and learn what they're doing Mm -hmm. and educate them about what they need to know about your wife. And you can make sure that whole system is up and running before you leave town for a week. Which is to say that sometimes people's beliefs get in their own way. And in his case, his belief is, I'm the husband. I have to do everything. Okay, there's going to be these moments when I can't do everything. Then I allow help. No, you get to allow help now. That's what I learned for myself. And that's what I'm passing on to him. A lot of the conversation is not just about first we do A, then we do B, then we do C, and I report back. It's why, what are the obstacles? What's getting in the way? What might make this easier just by little tweaks to how you're thinking about this or how I'm thinking about this? Yeah. So that's how you, you deal with it. 
What a beautiful example because it's not just women who feel that they can do everything. Men have that capacity, don't they, as well? Well, I'm the provider. I'm, I'm, the, like, provider. <laughs> yeah. I'm the provider. We both said it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as you discovered just the knowledge you obtain or acquired by your uh, son's diagnosis and then having an, another diagnosis of anxiety, getting that knowledge can actually increase your confidence to deal with a situation, can't it? So it's oh, yes. those resources you were talking about earlier, isn't it? Yeah. And one thing I know about myself is after going through these things with my kids, I have resilience, baby. I have learned that I am resilient and there's all sorts of terrifying, scary things that could happen in my life, in my business, in my you know family. But you know what? I'm going to handle it. I have resources. I have community. I have capacity. I have enough of a positive attitude that I know I can work my way through. I have communication skills. That's what we all need for crisis. Communication, capacity, and community. I didn't know I had all that before the night that my son was diagnosed with diabetes. I thought it was just all me, a single mom, had to handle it all myself. And then I had to figure out how to switch my right. mindset and had to learn how to be resilient. Oh, my goodness. Now that's in my pocket forever as long as I live. That's it. And and you can feel proud. I've got, I've actually... I've got evidence. I am all this. I am resilient. I, I I know how to access resources. I was curious the, about the business person, the businessman, because he's now going away on business. Are you able to give him some steps that he might be able to take? Because I would imagine he's there, but his mind is back with his wife, isn't it? Yeah, we'll probably talk about that in a couple of weeks when he's getting ready to go and he's really getting his mind wrapped around, oh my gosh, okay. her soon. Um, but one thing that I've been trying to help him with throughout, because I mean, they are my client, but originally she was my client, and but he's the point person. And so I've been supporting him too, is encouraging him to take time out for himself. Mm-hmm. Like when she was in the hospital, she was in the hospital just for the day when the cracked rib, she went home. But then the next day with the knee, she ended up having to be in the hospital for a few days before surgery. And I was able to say to him, okay, she's not there tonight. This is a time you can, you know, take a bath and go to bed early, have a drink, like whatever is nurturing to you, really focus on yourself tonight because the hospital's got her. Yeah, You don't have to be on duty. You need to, even if you don't feel like it right at this moment, you need to take this time to recharge now. Yeah. Seize the opportunity, get some respite. And uh, was he able to do that? <laughs> yeah, he actually, he actually was. And so, I, I didn't know him. I, I didn't, I, I've never met him in person before a, uh, a few months ago. I, I didn't know him at all. And this is like, you know, big Texas guy who's, you know, very manly man. And the fact that he has let me talk to him about it's okay to wrap yourself up in your blankie (laughs) is pretty awesome. I feel honored that he lets me have that conversation with him. So you obviously reached that part of him that needed that additional mothering. He was hurting and you were able to reach him at that level, which I think is brilliant the powers of your coaching there, Deborah, for sure. I think a lot of point people try to like, nope, we can't think about me. It's the person in the hospital bed, you know, the metaphorical or little hospital bed. It's not about me now, but being the point person is sometimes harder than it is to be the person zero. And having been the point person so much, that's really a big part of my message is to say you are very valuable as the point person and you have to take care of yourself so you can be there in service of the person zero. It's your job to think about yourself now, even though you think it's not, so that you can be there tomorrow 
for the other person. Yeah, because if you go down, then who's going to steer the ship, so to speak? Yeah. What I was curious about, Deborah, was how do men in general, I'm sure women do it as well, do they share this at work and is the support for them if they do it work or is this something they have to they feel they the need to keep to themselves great question the men that i have worked with who you know tiny subset of the men in the entire world have been very hesitant to share what's going on at work yeah they don't feel like it's safe. They need to continue appearing large and in charge and on top of things. And if they start showing any weakness, this is their mindset. If they start showing any weakness or vulnerability, then somebody else will seize on their power and, you know, they'll lose ground. And I see women having the same reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most brilliant leaders are the ones who are able to integrate their personal experience with their professional the ones who are able to say okay team this is really rough Mm -hmm. most of you don't know this my wife has a terminal illness I am going to be here at work but I also need to be there for her and so I'm going to make these changes um, and I'm setting your expectations as opposed to trying to do it surreptitiously and hope nobody notices I think Mm -hmm. those are so much more respected and appreciated. And then when the people on that guy's team have something else going on at home, they're more likely to show up and say, I need something. I need to do something differently because I'm dealing with this challenge at home. So by opening up and allowing themselves to be vulnerable is giving others that permission. And I think it would can only make uh, for better team relationships. Yeah. If you've got, if you're working for somebody like that, you've got more respect for them. Well, wow, that was big. And he or she trusted us with this information. Yeah. Yeah. That was a beautiful, beautiful illustration of what goes on. That's just one little challenge in the workplace. But there's also when that leader is faced with something like a death or divorce or those burnout feelings of overwhelm and and they get to creep in. How can they begin to navigate their workspace as well as take care of their own, their own emotions and feelings? I think it's that, you know, it's, it's very individual. It depends on the person. But when I start working with someone I start from the strategy level, like, okay, what are you going through? What are you struggling with the most? What are you most worried about? Okay, now that we understand that, let's envision what is the best possible outcome of the scenario? Like, let's just dream, but let's not be magical. So, you know, going back to this client I told you about, just because it's on our minds, um, we would like to make it so his wife's not going to die. That maybe is a little magical thinking. So given that she is going to die, what 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 is your vision for how you would like to show up for her in these last months that you have with her? Mm-hmm. And then we try to kind of plot a route from where we are to where that person would like to be and how that person would like to be. And sometimes that involves them getting some more resources. Um, for example, in that family, I help them find the, the right hospice agency mm. for that. Um, they live nowhere near me, but thanks, Internet, we, we got that. Um, sometimes it's uh, I do some research. I guess I was doing research there. Sometimes it's research to connect someone to the resources. Sometimes it's resources that I'm already aware of. Um, sometimes it's research to help uh, make a decision. For example... I worked with another couple where the one of them was also dying in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and the doctor had said, he, what you have is pretty rare. There's a couple of things you could try. You know, do you want to do some sort of clinical thing? And his partner said, uh, 
I don't know. I'm sitting here in the hospital every day with him. I, I, I you know, trying to advocate. I'm like, how am I supposed to go figure this out? And so I got the medical information and I did research and I contacted everyone who was running clinical trials in that space. Mm -hmm. And I was able to come back and say to them, okay, here, you could do one of these four trials or you could do nothing. Here's the pros and cons of each. What questions do you have? You decide what you want to do. Yeah. And that was um, really valuable because neither of them had the capacity to go get that information and why that the, the hospital wasn't providing that, I couldn't really tell you. So sometimes it's about research. And then we also strategize for difficult communications, difficult conversations. How are you going to have the talk with your team? Mm. Do you need to put out a memo about what just happened in your company? Do you need to have an all hands meeting with your company about what just happened? Um, so we're helping to them to make better decisions and to communicate more effectively and to find ways of being that will help them show up the way that they wanted to show up given the difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I end up staying on longer with clients after we get through the crisis and we work on, okay, what are the systems that we can build in your life or in your business so that when this, if this happens again, God forbid, or another crisis happens, which I hate to say, but it's going to, because that's how life works. Maybe we can make it so it's not going to be as hard on you next time as it was this time, because you already have certain things in place. Mm -hmm. So remember when I said before about the three keys to handling crises are capacity communication and community, those are things I can help people work on to in preparedness mode, even if they're not in a crisis now, so that when they are, they'll have those in place and it'll be a little bit easier to cope. Yeah, rather than a attempting to figure it all out when you are in those crisis moments. I love how you said that you get them to walk through how they would like it announced at work mm -hmm. in the event of a death, even the death of the leader or the manager or whoever it is in that organization can ultimately help because word gets around and nothing is worse in a team or an organization of the not knowing. Mm -hmm. So by you kind of working to circumnavigate that, that can be a bonus, I would imagine. Do you go into um, companies to help them deal with these situations? Yeah, most of my clients I work with virtually in yeah. their companies or in their lives. Um, but some, but I do go with my clients places, like going to their workspace, going to a courtroom with them, going oh. to a difficult medical visit. Um, you know, I'm thinking about one client I had who was. Um, had just moved to a new part of the country and then was diagnosed with breast cancer. She, okay. and it was during the pandemic, she hadn't really developed relationships yet in that new part of the country and mm -hmm. she was single. So she was living on her own. I went with her to the initial meeting with the surgeon and the initial meeting with the uh, person who was going to be doing the chemotherapy and I don't live near where she was, so I couldn't go in person. And even if I was, this was like late 2020, even if I lived near her, I couldn't have gone to the hospital with her because they wouldn't have let me in because, you know, they weren't letting people who weren't sick into the hospital to support the people who were sick at the time. But thank you, FaceTime. I went with her to the meeting and I took all the notes. And before the meeting, I helped her identify what are the questions she wanted to get answered while she was there. And then when she started getting overwhelmed, I was able to jump in and say, Dr. So-and-so, she had one more question that I don't think we've covered yet. And I was capturing all that and then debriefing with the person afterwards. So yes, I go with people into their situations virtually and sometimes in real life too, sometimes in the workplace, sometimes in more personal spaces. Mm -hmm. My goodness. So you become the resource for that person. Mm -hmm. And I love how you said FaceTime. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> it's amazing what we've learned just yeah. coming through COVID. Right. Uh, I mean, how many of us would jump on a Zoom call? It was unheard of, but all of a sudden, everybody got really comfortable with it. Or who would bring Zoom to their doctor's office? Nobody. <laughs> but now, hey, we can do that. Yep. I open my iPad. All right. Here's my yeah. person. I need you to advocate yeah. or, or help me out. Oh, so you truly are a navigator, aren't you? Yeah. And I'm a partner. I'm a crisis navigation partner. And that's a term that I made up based on exactly what I feel like I love doing to be of yeah. service and what I'm the best at and what people have given me the feedback that the ways in which I help them that no one else had been able to. No, I think that is brilliant. And I love how you're still able to uh, bring in your research background to support research. you. And you yeah. love research. I could I tell did. when you were That's talking why. about it. <laughs> yeah. I love to get all the information and structure it and put it in order. Like I love to synthesize. Ooh, fun. <laughs> dopamine hit, dopamine hit. <laughs> <laughs> synthesis brings me to, brings me dopamine it's so true yeah and just being able to share that with others gives you additional knowledge and the fact oh, that yeah. you're you're reading about it and now you're sharing it it's and I love always learning and every situation that I've been brought into is different from the last you know even if two people were diagnosed with the same thing or two businesses face similar problems it's, you know, I'm, I'm learning about the business itself. I'm learning about the treatment center itself. I'm just, there's always just so much to learn and I love learning. Exactly. So people that come to you are either from the corporate world or they find you through a referral or a word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Do you find that once you've taken them through some of your coaching, they're more open? to opening up at work or uh, do they find their environments just not that supportive if they were? I'm just curious if the environment, the corporate world has changed in in yeah. the, the pandemic. That's a great question. Um, if I can't get them to open up with me privately, Oh. I'm not their person, <laughs> you know, like I need to help them find somebody else because if it's somebody, if I can't crack them open and let them share their hopes and fears, uh, then I'm not going to really be able to help them. Now we can make a, ra after that, we can make a rational decision together about does it make sense to go be vulnerable about this at work? So let's take into consideration what do we know about your organization's culture? What do we know about what's happening in the organization right now and what are the stressors and what are the struggles. And so we look at it all big picture. A lot of my clients also don't work. They work in, in a, they have their own businesses. So they don't work in a giant corporation in an office building. When I went to um, on Tuesday, I went to give this talk. It was to a group of women in technology at a particular mm -hmm. biotech firm in Cambridge. And I went in there and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I've been inside an office building for like three years. I forgot what it's like in here. You all come here together. <laughs> I mean, I worked in office buildings, you know, for decades. It was like a foreign experience to me. So I don't always know, you know, what's the latest in, in corporate America in general yeah. to answer your question, but it's interesting to me too. And I, I think that in a lot of organizations, people have opened up and we've seen people at work who are really in their homes and what's going on over their shoulder when their dog walks in or mm -hmm. when the doorbell rings because UPS has just arrived. And I think the shutdown time helped open us up more and blur that line more of the personal and the professional. And then there's people who say, well, people aren't working the way they used to because they were used to working at home and now they're more interested in doing their laundry during the day than they are coming to all the meetings. I, 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 I'm sure that's true in some contexts, yeah. but I think in the healthier companies, the employers are seeing they, their opportunity to partner with the employees and they have the employees be the company's partners and acknowledging that, yes, 
you're a human with laundry and a doorbell Mm -hmm. and a dog and a cancer diagnosis. And all that affects how you're showing up at work. And we have to allow that as the employer, because otherwise we're not going to be able to get the best out of you. You know, we're not, you're not going to be able to do your job and you're going to waste so much energy trying to hide everything that you're not going to be able to give us what we need of your brain and your hands and your heart. Brilliant. And hopefully more employees, big corporations will be hearing this message Mm -hmm. and will take it to heart because that truly is what is happening, isn't it? If people aren't listened to or taken in, you know, you're not just a person on a, on a, a, you know, a seat, Mm -hmm. uh, a warm body and sitting, occupying space. You are actually a human being with a lot of emotions and a lot of things potentially going on. And to me, if you can take care of your employees in that way, they're going to respect and trust you and you will get more out of them, I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And I don't know what it's this is like in Canada right now, but in the United States, over the past few years, so many more employees have just opted out of the workforce and said, you know what, I, I, this is not worth it to me. Yeah, a pandemic could come and somebody could die and all these bad things could happen. And I'm not working 88 hours a week for this business anymore. I'm just Mm -hmm. not doing it. So there's fewer employees to choose from it. There's a smaller labor market of available people. And so the employers are having to make adjustments with that in mind, because they literally can't get what they used to get out of some of their people. Yeah, fear is no longer a motivator mm. for yeah for uh, for management. Yeah, exactly. If you yeah. don't do this, you're going to lose your job. That's okay. I'm going to go do this job somewhere else. Oh, good. I'll get a severance package. <laughs> exactly. Pick me for the layoff, sir. Please. <laughs> Deb, mm-hmm. is there any final words you'd like to leave our listeners with we've covered an awful lot of ground today and I want to thank you and appreciate you for going in all those little places with me yeah thank you for asking these questions I'm thinking did we talk enough about grief given what your podcast is about and I just want to say and it's something you probably talk about in your podcast grief or responding to loss, it's not linear. It's not a one and done. So you had that really difficult situation or that crisis and the crisis ended and the person was out of the woods medically or something, or they died. Either way, it's not just over for you emotionally. You have to heal from it. You have to grieve the loss of how you expected to spend that time when you wound up in the crisis. And you you just have to let yourself take a while to get back to the full speed at which you operated in your regularly scheduled programming before. So all this to say in the connection to grief, I really want to encourage us all to be more gentle with ourselves, meet ourselves where we are, allow ourselves more support, And it's okay to let things go sometimes and not accomplish everything that we thought we could do this day, this week, this month, this year. It's okay to adjust. Yeah, and find your own rhythm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And before I let everybody go, I thank you for sharing the grief component because I'm sure you've noticed going through job loss, divorce, pet loss and all the other losses people loss (laughs) people loss there's there's uh grief there and I don't know if people actually recognize that either yeah I think grief is something we don't talk about enough and people just picture oh grief is they that person stood at the corner at the memorial service and cried and that was yesterday and now back to work yeah not how it works it's not that it's not how it was well clearly we need to have another uh we have to have you back on the podcast so we can talk a little bit more in depth but what you were bringing up was just so fascinating guy 
I went with it. <laughs> Great. Me too. I went with what you were asking me. So this is really fun. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway. We are totally out of time, listeners. I know I say this every, every episode, but we really are. And I hope you've enjoyed what we've been discussing today. It was a little lighter than some of the episodes that I've been bringing just recently. So, Deborah, thank you for finding me and coming on this podcast. I've so appreciated talking about highly functioning women in the workplace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, Please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at understandinggrief.com. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.